To begin with, I appreciate um, there's probably varying different levels of knowledge on ad tech um, amongst us. Um, so I think a good starting point really is to set the scene um, in ad tech and, and look at the various different kind of regulatory regimes that play a part here and then go on to look at why ad tech is so difficult in the current environment and why we are struggling so much to find an answer and a compliant answer um, with regards to compatibility with the e-privacy directive and GDPR. So with that in mind, this first slide really in, um, outlines the, the interaction of the various different bodies of law. So if we start first with the e-privacy directive, I think this is a good starting point because the e-privacy directive is that piece of legislation which, among other things, governs whenever you install information on someone's device or you access information from someone's device. So we, we say the cookie rules come from here, but that's probably underselling it. When we talk about cookies, we mean similar technologies, SDK and app. Uh, device fingerprinting, whenever you're accessing or downloading information from someone's device. And that's obviously generally the starting point in online behavioral advertising. Something is being embedded in the device of the user that allows you to track um, their preferences and then build profiles around that. The second area is GDPR. Um, and some in this industry, um, traditionally in particular, argue that this isn't really, why is this personal data? And the reason they've said that is often they only have a device ID. You know, they have maybe IP address, they have a cookie ID, they have the identifiers, the advertising identifiers from the phone, whether the IDFA or the Android equivalent. They're all just kind of these numbers. Um, and some people have argued, why is this even personal data? Why are we even having this discussion? Um, unfortunately, arguing that this isn't uh, personal data, that, that ship has, has well sailed now. We know for a number of years the Article 29 Working Party um, have been of the view that this is personal data, even though you may never, sometimes you do, but you may never know the, the real name of the individual. And the reason for that is the Article 29 Working Party say if you have enough information to single someone out and treat them differently, uh, this is personal data. And that's invariably kind of what's happening here. You may not know their name, but you do know enough information in order to kind of target advertising more effectively at them. So GDPR uh, plays a significant role. And of course, what follows from that is all of this data then is invariably personal that you're using online, and you have to comply with the GDPR principles as you would any other personal data. The final area um, in terms of kind of overlap, and one we won't be looking at in much detail today, but I just wanted for completeness to, to kind of illustrate that it's there, are some of the industry codes, like the European Digital Advertising Alliance um, rules for online behavioral advertising, and these are kind of an added layer of complexity. Many of the rules here kind of overlap with some of the data protection considerations, in particular in relation to kind of processing of sensitive personal data for online behavioral advertising, similarly the kind of targeting of uh, advertising at children, um, so that's another area that kind of forms part of the overall um, compliance picture. So these are the kind of three key areas that we'll be looking at, in particular GDPR and e-privacy and the interaction between them. So I think one of the, one of the difficult um, parts of, of ad tech um, and, and what makes it quite difficult from a compliance perspective is just the huge amount of data sharing that happens in a very quick amount of time. So generally, you know, when you when you're kind of browsing online, you're logging onto a website, in the time that you, your website is loading or the website is rendering, um, you've got the publisher website selling, wanting to sell inventory, advertising on their website, and they are holding an auction for that um, for that inventory in real time. So you've got on the other side of the picture, you've got advertisers wanting and bidding on that inventory. And of course, those advertisers want to target advertising as effectively as possible and use the kind of cookie data from individuals to kind of learn insights and, and segment individuals so they know that the advertising is going to those that are most likely to convert and buy their products. In the middle of this kind of compliance picture, we've got a number of different um, entities um, whether that's supply side platform, that's the SSP, which is helping the publisher manage and sell their, their inventory. On the other side, we've got the DSP, the demand side platform, which is helping um, buy inventory for the advertisers. And then we've got kind of ad exchanges, really running this advertising network, this real-time bidding between them, um, again in real time. And we've got a huge number of other intermediaries. We've mentioned things here like external bidders, other subcontractors, et cetera. So one of the things that make ad tech particularly difficult is that you've got this mass sharing of data. And it's difficult, given that mass sharing of data, in often what is milliseconds, to quote um, ICO's recent report, to kind of comply with the requirements of transparency and consent under GDPR. So I think having set the scene, um, 
it's now useful to kind of take a step back and see why, why is this so, so difficult um, in the current environment? Um, what, why are we struggling to find compatibility between ad tech and, and GDPR and e-privacy? And I think the key starting point there is the fact that e-privacy requires, generally requires consent whenever you place a cookie or similar technology. Um, and any of you in the audience, sure many of you have done GDPR compliance projects, you will know for your general compliance, one of the first things you, you would have done is move away from consent when you were preparing your GDPR uh, compliance project for lots of processing, because consent is now so difficult under GDPR. You, you know, before we used to ask for consent for everything. Now consent, you only really rely on consent where you have no order, other alternative lawful basis. Um, or the law says you require consent. And this is one of those areas, the use of cookies and similar technologies where the law says you need consent. And consent is really difficult under GDPR. That's why no one wants to rely on it if you can avoid it. These are just a summary. Many of you will be familiar with the requirements already, but the summary of why consent is difficult, you know, it must be freely given. It must be revocable without detriment. It must be specific, informed, um, involved in an unambiguous act. The rules relating to consent, um, getting parental consent for um, children under 16 in certain jurisdictions. Um, consent needs to be demonstrable. Um, and for those of you that have looked at these issues in detail, you will know something like just the requirement that consent be freely given. We could spend an hour just talking about that generally. So all of these requirements are incredibly difficult, which explains why you know, we try to avoid consent if we can. As I say, here you can't avoid consent. And that, then you've got added air, air, uh, layers of complexity, I think. Firstly, from the multiplicity of players, which we've just mentioned, but also because many of the players in the online advertising ecosystem don't have an end user relationship. And if you don't have an end user relationship, you have to rely on others to get you consent. And that's generally the publisher, um, where they're requiring the publisher contractually to, um, to, get, um, to get that consent. And the industry generally was kind of underpinned. If you don't have an end user relationship yourself, you still need, you know, most of these parties are data controller. They still need to give notice. They still need to give consent. So you have to rely on contract. And the, the online advertising generally was underpinned generally by a nexus of contracts, which was saying, you know, if you are, if we're, if you are giving us this data, you will ensure that appropriate notice and consent has been given. There are other difficulties, I think, when you when you look at that. Um, indirectly obtained consent. Firstly, you're a step away. All of those parties are a step away. It's not within their control to get consent or give notice themselves. Secondly, contracts. There has been a lot of guidance recently from regulators, certainly in enforcement and similar, where they're saying there's real limitations on contract. The quote I give here at the bottom of the slide from the Keneal is a recent case. Um, it was uh, December um, or late 2018 in the context of online advertising, where a party, the Keneal have found a party that was receiving uh, device IDs and location data from another um, app company that had been collecting this data. The Keneal found in France the consent wasn't valid. They went on to say um, that it wasn't good enough for this company to argue that they had a contractual warranty on the partner that was giving them the data to ensure the consent was valid and allowed them to process it. That was no defense to point to the contractual warranty. And as you can see in the quote, they say, the obligations imposed by Article 7, which is consent under GDPR, cannot be fulfilled by the mere presence of a contractual clause guaranteeing an, an initial consent validly collected. So you have to do more. And what that effectively means in practice, if you can't rely on a contractual warranty, then you have to do some level of due diligence to ensure that the consent you are obtaining um, is valid. And that's, that's very difficult, particularly when you consider, as we say, a lot of this happens in almost real time.